All right, g'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today we are going to be doing a bit of a different video in terms of what we've been doing over the last four to six weeks. Obviously, it's been very draft and trade heavy. In particular, of course, we've been focusing on the trade period, both you know in the, the lead up to that and then a bit of uh, analysis content after that. But now all the water's kind of gone under the bridge and to sort of get back to the content that I would normally do following the grand final, which is around looking back at the predictions I made at the start of the year and basically assessing just how bad I did. Now this particular ladder prediction is one I've been cringing about and maybe that's why I've procrastinated a little bit because I've made some absolute howler calls and there's no doubt there's quite a few of you who have not let me forget some of them. Some of these predictions are just El Stanco, as they say in Spain. So in today's video, basically just gonna watch back the video I did at the start of the year with my final ladder prediction and the grand final and all the awards and see just how bad it was. But also listening to, you know, the rationale and the explanation which I've included in this video as well. I've chopped it up a little bit so the video doesn't go too long, but it's just sort of a summary of the main points that I made when I made these predictions. As always guys, don't forget to check out the sponsors of the True Footy YouTube channel, manscaped.com, where you can get 20% off and free shipping on the Elite Male Grooming products. Summer's coming up here in Australia and it's a good time to sort of get a rid of that winter coat that we've all let build up over the colder months. So do yourself a favor, go to manscaped.com and check out their awesome products. And if you do grab anything, make sure you use the code TRUEFOOTY20 for, like I said, 20% off and free shipping. Let's get into the video. So we're just going to rip into it and the video starts with me predicting who I think is going to win the wooden spoon. First up, I have to say the Adelaide Crows are going to go back to back with Wooden Spoons. And I guess the difference between them and the other rebuilding sides around this region are the fact that their kids are just a little bit more raw, a little bit less developed than some of the teams I have ahead of them. They've got the youngest list statistically, they're the second least experienced list in the league. And while they did end the year last year with some momentum, which is a really, really positive sign, they're sort of building cohesiveness. I do also think that Matthew Nix as a new coach is going to continue to be very, very patient and give the kids the opportunity opportunities and which will result in as far as I'm concerned less wins. Okay, so straight off the bat, I predicted Adelaide to win the wooden spoon. Look, it's not the absolute worst call, especially when you compare it to some of the predictions that I have coming up. The Adelaide did finish in the bottom four. They finished 15th. Certainly did better than I expected, and I think I underrated their ability to perform well in big games straight away. Like in round one, they beat Geelong. They also beat Melbourne in the middle of the year as well. So their ability to you know switch on and compete with these really good experienced sides really impressed me. So that was the difference between them finishing last and fourth last, as it turned out. In second last spot, I've got North Melbourne who are of course under new coach David Noble and are undergoing a bit of a hardcore rebuild. Now, to contrast the Crows, I think North have been rebuilding a little bit longer and thus their kids have a little bit more experience. So I do think they'll probably be able to snatch a few more wins. Now we know with their off-season moves, they lost a fair bit of experience with Ben Brown and Sean Higgins exiting the club. And I do think that David Noble, despite having a three-year plan, is going to take this year to be patient and properly test the list. So in 17th spot, I had North Melbourne, who eventually won the wooden spoon by finishing in 18th spot with four and a half victories. Honestly, that's fair enough. I think I got that close to the mark. I think the only thing I got wrong, obviously, was I thought Adelaide might be a little bit worse. But all things considered, it was a big rebuilding year for North Melbourne. Certainly played some flashes throughout the year, which suggested maybe this rebuild won't take quite as long as maybe people thought at first. But overall, kind of nailed that one. So fairly happy with that. In 16th spot, we've got the Hawthorne Footy Club, and unfortunately, the rebuild they so desperately wanted to avoid is definitely well and truly here. On paper, the list is still relatively experienced, but I think the need for them to add elite young talent to their list is still very clear. And while they're definitely good enough to catch a few teams napping this year and steal just enough wins to avoid the bottom two, I think the stability is going to go a little bit and I think they're going to find it very hard to avoid the bottom four. So Hawthorne in 16th. So I had Hawthorne in 16th and they ended up finishing 14th on the ladder, save for a pretty good end to the season. Obviously, they beat some reasonable teams in that period. They drew with Melbourne. They beat the Western Bulldogs. Had they not had that late flash in the season, I might have gotten this a little bit closer, but still the difference between 14th and 16th is not too bad. So overall, I think I'm going okay. Believe me, it's going to get worse. Rounding out the bottom four, an unpopular choice perhaps, but I've gone with the Gold Coast Suns on the basis that while their list has a lot of elite young talent, it's still very, very raw. You factor in again that this is a longer season and as it stands now, they're going to have to travel more than they did in 2020. I do think the Suns probably will dwindle as the season goes on just enough to finish in the bottom four and I think they're still a year or two away from really pushing finals. 
Again, so far so good. I had the Gold Coast Suns rounding out the bottom four and they ended up finishing 16th. So just one spot off where they eventually finished. So the bottom four, I think is fairly sound there. The one that I missed is Collingwood and the one that I put in that didn't make it was Hawthorne, but they finished only one spot above that. So the teams that I did have in the bottom four were fairly good shouts so far. In 14th spot, just avoiding the bottom four, I've got the Sydney Swans. Again, another side that's been rebuilding for a couple of years now, but the difference is they've got someone called Buddy Franklin on their list. I think they're a little bit further along in their rebuild than some of the teams that I've already mentioned and in particular the young quality on that list is really really strong. I think they're just young enough as a collective to not really quite push finals but with someone like Buddy Franklin who can win games off his own boot they'll jag enough to avoid the bottom four. They're pretty much at the end of their rebuild they've added a lot of really strong young talent. So that one obviously is a bit of a howler. I, I think I can sort of forgive myself a little bit for this one. I did correctly highlight that Sydney were probably at the end of their rebuild. I certainly didn't see coming that they would eventually produce. So they ended up winning 15 games and making the finals as well in the top six. So look, let's call it what it is. I got that desperately wrong. I think the logic was fine, but Sydney certainly exceeded what I expected. And to be fair to them as well, they didn't really do it off the back of Buddy Franklin. They did it off a very, very good team unit with some of the best young talent going around. So well done, Sydney. You smashed mine and I dare say a few other people's expectations this year. In 13th spot, I've got Essendon, and this was a side I kind of defended over the offseason because they were talked about a lot for going into a rebuild, having lost three important players, and I sort of counter-argued that I didn't quite think they were entering a rebuild. I think they've been in one for a few years now. Of the best 22 players they've lost, probably only Adam Saad out of that trio really, really takes away from their best 22 in the here and now, and they've sort of supplemented their list with some young guys like Jai Caldwell and Peter Wright, who are important going forward. That being said, despite all that, I think Essendon and consistently inconsistent it's really really hard to bet on them really pushing finals with any confidence what I will say is that they're the first team I've mentioned out of the group so far who I think can play finals okay so on face value I had Essendon finishing 13th and then up making finals of course sliding into the top eight well I did get that very very wrong I don't think you could say it was a really stupid prediction I was still fairly optimistic and I did suggest that Essendon were going to be better than people expected this year I think other people were predicting them to be in the race for the spoon this year I basically said Said, Essendon could play finals they're good enough to but they're so desperately inconsistent that they'll fall away late and they proved me wrong so well done on a great season Essendon in 12th spot another unpopular choice here but I'm gonna bet on the Bulldogs sliding out of the finals and having an absolute stinker I'm not really saying this because I don't rate them I do rate the overall quality of the list although I have argued against the fact that adding someone like Adam Trelaw is really going to take them to the next level in 2021 adding someone like Stefan Martin to support Tim English was probably a good move in the ruck there and I Arguably, it's probably an overdue move, but I do think the dogs are going to have issues juggling all their midfield talent this year. Adam Trulaw comes in. Does that mean someone like a Marcus Bontempelli has to play forward? Is that really the best use of his elite talents? I'm not sure. They'll definitely be praying someone like Aaron Norton has a good run with injury this year, who's a little bit underdone last year. And I think they're a top eight quality side, but they're my bet to slide out of the eight in 2021. <sighs> Fuck. I wish I could say this is the dumbest prediction that I made in this video, but it's probably a close second, but we'll get to that. I think I like to do this thing where I try to predict a team that everyone's going to do really well to do shit, and then a team that everyone expects to do shit to do very well. This year, I absolutely stunk that up. I think my logic was, you know, just because the Bulldogs recruit some of these gun midfielders, such as Adam Trelaw, doesn't make them that much better. And I'm still kind of comfortable with the logic of that, but obviously it's a long bow to draw to suggest that that's going to be a factor in them dropping down the ladder. That, I don't know what I was thinking there. That's an absolute handle. I'll put my hands up and say, I absolutely sucked. I did highlight a lack of scoring power. I said Aaron Norton needed to have a big year. I didn't even, don't think I even mentioned Josh Bruce, but scoring power was something they well and truly answered this year. And they made it all the way to the grand finals well. So well done to the Bulldogs, and I'd imagine they're probably going to be around the mark again next year. In 11th spot, I've got the Fremantle Dockers, and I have to say, they're probably a side that's been made to look a little bit worse than they really are due to extensive injuries over the last few years. Fully fit, they've got a great backline with Hamling, Pierce, and now Luke Ryan all playing very, very high level footy on their day, and their midfield, which was previously a bit top-heavy, has sort of added that extra layer with Brayshaw, Chera, and Sarong really coming on last year. They gave up on the Jesse Hogan experiment pretty quickly, and as such, I think their forward line average avenues are going to be a real problem for them going forward. That being said, they're still good enough to challenge a few teams and be a tricky opponent in 2021. Yeah. 
All right, so I followed up with an absolute howler by getting Fremantle absolutely bang on. Don't know how much more there is to say about that. Fremantle sort of had a very small, slow, incremental season of improvement. I still think they're on the right track, but obviously losing a player like Adam Chera is a massive blow. So if they can stop the bleeding in terms of players going back to their home state, I still think Fremantle are tracking along okay. In 10th spot, I've got the GWS Giants, who by now must be pretty used to bleeding elite talent. Although this year, I think it might have been a bridge too far with Jeremy Cameron and Zach Williams, both very important players exiting the club. Jeremy Cameron's obviously on top of being an elite player, really important for them structurally. And I think that now puts a lot of pressure on Jeremy Finlayson, Jake Riccardi, and maybe Jesse Hogan as well to establish a good frontline trio. I think they're a very, very good side, potentially top four to six quality but I just have them missing the finals this year. Okay, so GWS I had in 10th and they ended up finishing 7th and won a final to boot as well. My logic was that they'd lost so many players in one hit, in particular Jeremy Cameron, Zach Williams, some really, really important players. That plus what was a very disappointing season last year. I didn't have too much faith in them pushing up the ladder. I did highlight that they're probably a top four to six team on quality and I still believe that. I think going into next year, they really do have the potential to push late in September, but obviously they exceeded my expectations. I still think they have issues like I said in this video around organizing that front three and Jesse Hogan showed flashes this year but may not necessarily be the answer to their problems but either way fair to say I definitely underrated GWS slightly. In ninth spot cruelly missing the finals I've got Carlton and with all the optimism going into this year for Carlton fans they're going to look at this and think that is probably a bit harsh. They had a great offseason adding two really important defensive key pieces with Zach Williams and Adam Saad adding a lot of rebound to that side. For me though the simple response to that is I just don't don't see their team being good enough in the here and now to be better than some of the teams I'm about to mention as well. All right, so Carlton were quite disappointing based on my expectations. I felt like putting them in ninth, I'd actually get some flack from Carlton fans, but in the end, I woefully overrated them. They finished 13th and I highlighted the influence of new guys like Saad and Williams having a big impact, but unfortunately they couldn't quite hit top form and Carlton just couldn't quite improve. So they sit in a similar sort of spot as where they did 12 months ago. Now they've recruited Adam Chera and I think that's why we still may have a little bit of doubt in terms of backing Carlton for next year. But yeah, I think Blues fans will say the same. It was a disappointing year for the Carlton Footy Club. In eighth spot, just sliding into the finals, I've got the Melbourne Demons, who were notoriously a very, very hard team to pick. I think the reason for that, other than the fact that they're a real Jekyll and Hyde side, is that while they have immense individual star power, the cohesiveness of that team and the overall execution and reliability has not been there for a couple of years now. I mean, individually, you got some very, very elite players there. You got Christian Petrarca, who announced himself as a superstar last year. Max Gorn kind of regained some of the form that we've seen in previous years. And even someone like Clayton Oliver has a lot of upside in that midfield. It's just gonna be about how well that team comes together talent-wise. Okay, so I had the eventual premiers in eighth spot. I estimated that they would move up exactly one spot from 2020, where they obviously showed a lot of improvement after a terrible 2019. Ultimately, it just exploded for Melbourne. It all clicked at the same time. I'm sure not many people would have seen it coming together quite in that fashion, although I did highlight in that video, I did see the immense star potential of a lot of their players. But no other way to slice it, Melbourne well and truly exceeded my expectations. In seventh spot, I've got the St. Kilda Footy Club, and again, their fans are probably going to think this is underrating them, and to be fair, it is very hard to make a case for St. Kilda not improving in 2021. They've got a very, very young list. I think the youngest from all the finalists, if I'm not mistaken, last year, and they not only made the finals, but they won a final. On top of that, they've added someone like Brad Crouch and Jack Higgins, two guys right in that right age demographic for their list. And in particular, I think the midfield was somewhere they needed to bolster. Heaps of their best 22 are young and still improving. Guys like Nick Caulfield and Hunter Clark come to mind immediately. And someone like Max King, as he develops, will be a very exciting talent. There was a bit of an editing mistake in that. I actually had St. Kilda 7th, but I put up the graphic 8th. So that had me actually predicting St. Kilda would drop one spot from the previous year because I didn't think they necessarily had it to match the other teams around that range because they didn't really anticipate that they would have quite the, the star power to match it with, you know, the top five or six teams in the comp. Ultimately, it was a year where things couldn't really get going for the Saints. I know they had their injury woes as well, and I think fitness must have been a big issue because the consistency of performance definitely wasn't there. To finish 10th overall is a pretty bitterly disappointing result. They did have some good games in there with their wins over the Lions and West Coast early in the year as well, which shows that they've still got a little bit of something in there as well. But I think it's fair to say St Kilda were kind of disappointed at many people in terms of their expectations for them in 2021. In sixth spot, I have my beloved West Coast Eagles. You can definitely make the argument there is a lot of upside for the Eagles. If you look at 2020, they had a really bad injury run and to be honest, had to hub 
in Queensland where they notoriously play terrible football. So just by virtue of the fact that there won't be as many games in Queensland under lights, West Coast should have it a little bit more their way in 2021. That being said, I think there's a lot of key issues for the Eagles, particularly around their game plan and their midfield. It's quite concerning to me that Nat Nui was our best player last year in the ruck, an absolute dominant season. Tim Kelly was recruited and played pretty good football, and yet our midfield was by far our worst line. Now, I don't want to sell my boys short. I think 2020 wasn't a great reflection on how good they can be. I think they can win the flag, but... I'm not going to bet on it. I think they're going to finish similar to where they did in the last couple of years, and I'm just praying that I'm wrong. Well, I was wrong, but in the worst way possible ever. Look, if you've been following the channel across this year, you'd know how disappointed I was with the West Coast Eagles this year. To be honest, I think all the points I made in that were sound. I still think the Eagles on paper had one of the best lists. Certainly not the best, but certainly good enough to mix it with the top four, if not actually make it. To me, the explanations for their drop-off this year where they looked at times one of the worst teams in the competition. It's not overly logical. So I was three spots off with this prediction because West Coast actually finished ninth, but it felt like a lot more than that because I think ninth really flattered the way they ended the season. Of course, I'm still optimistic about next year. I've clicked into preseason optimistic mode, but as you all know, the Eagles bitterly disappointed me this year. In fifth spot, I've got the Port Adelaide Footy Club. But for me, I guess out of the top four of last year, Port are the strongest candidate to slide out of it. I guess over the last few years, they've been the inconsistent one out of the group that I've mentioned there. That being said, they're well and truly in the flag hunt, and I wouldn't be surprised if they finished top two. Well, that one's not so bad. I actually think I've kind of nailed that. I think throughout the year, a lot of the commentary was, including by myself, but also other people, that Port Adelaide were in the mix for the top five. They were part of that top five that was a clear top five, but they were probably clearly the fifth best team in it. In the end, they beat the Bulldogs in the final round of the season to shoot into the top two. But I think we saw from the finals, the way the Bulldogs annihilated them in the prelim, that ultimately the Bulldogs were just on that high level of class. There's pretty fine margins between first and fifth this year. I think in one point late in the season, Melbourne could have realistically finished both first and fifth with like two rounds to go or something. So overall, a fairly sound prediction on Port Adelaide. Oh boy, the next one is probably the worst one. In fourth spot, this is a team that I think you guys will think is a bit of a stinky selection from me. I've got Collingwood defying the odds and making the top four. Now, Collingwood have been in the media Rats. for all the wrong reasons since the footy season ended. Firstly, with their horrible trade period by most accounts. And then, of course, everything with Eddie Maguire over the last few weeks. We saw them do a huge salary and experience dump over the offseason, which saw them release Adam Trelaw, Jaden Stevenson, and Tom Phillips from their list. Not only is that a bit of a blow to their depth, but experience-wise as well, they've gone from being the oldest list to just about middle of the pack. But I think people are forgetting they were injury-ravaged in 2020, and their midfield in particular has a lot of elite talent. Look, you can certainly make the argument that the PR nightmare could rock the club, and they could lose stability and completely shit the bed. Who knows? I can't really bet on that. I'm just going to call it as I see it based on the talent they've got. I think other than a big, tall, key target, which they would ideally love to have added last year, I think the side is so strong and they can definitely surprise people and go deep in finals. You know, we've had a good run on True Footy, but unfortunately, this is my retirement from content. Oh, man, that has not aged well. I don't know what's worse. You tell me. Predicting the Bulldogs to finish 12th or 13th, I think it was, or the Pies to uh, to finish in the top four. To be honest, I, I still think th that their drop-off is a little bit illogical. I think what happened was they started the year poorly, the morale was low, and you know, when, once a rot kind of sets in, you know, I think Collingwood turned their attention pretty quickly to getting games into the youth, and of course that was going to knock their ladder position down. I still think fully fit and healthy, you know, that they, they were comfortably better than the other bottom four teams this year, but ultimately it was just a rotten year for Nathan Buckley, the Collingwood Footy Club, and ultimately my predictions. The Pies are an interesting one to watch next year. They're going to get Nick Dacos in the draft, but on top of that, I still think their best 22 is fairly decent. So I don't think they'll stay down for long, even if it is again in 2022. In third spot, I've got last year's grand finalist, the Geelong Footy Club. And to be honest, it's hard to imagine a team that's ever been as all in for a premiership title as this team. I think by virtue of the fact that they're one of the oldest and experienced lists, people do tend to count against them at this time every year, and generally they prove us wrong. In 2019, they lost one of their best players in Tim Kelly to West Coast, and then they went one step further and made the grand final. They've added Jeremy Cameron, which means they now had the last two years of Coleman medalists, and they've also added Isaac Smith and Sean Higgins, and it's really hard to make a case for them not improving. That being said, I know that a team is not always the sum of all its parts, and in particular that forward line mix getting Hawkins and Cameron to work in the same forward line will be a challenge, but if they can get it working, they're going to be unstoppable. Hmm. 
Okay, so that one's not so bad. I kind of nailed the ladder position. Geelong eventually did finish third. On the point of, you know, the forward structure, I think that, that certainly got cranking this year. You know, Jeremy Cameron missed a fair bit of football, but when he was in, Geelong's forward line was really, really hard to stop. Because they got annihilated in the prelim, I think people reflect on this year and think Geelong were a lot further off than they actually were, but they were a very good team throughout most of the year, and I think Tom Stewart in particular in his season-ending injury was a bit of a turning point for them. So you've got to take the good predictions with the bad. I think I was fairly sound with that one. In second spot, I've got the Richmond Footy Club, and similar to the Hawks about four or five years ago, the Tigers are pretty much the best team until proven otherwise. And as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that's really going to threaten a third premiership in a row is the lack of hunger and drive. But from everything I've seen from this Richmond Footy Club, they don't really lack in either of those departments. Okay, so, you know, typically I was a bit of a basic pitch and I predicted Richmond to go deep in September again this year. And obviously they didn't. The wheels kind of fell off. They had injuries in particular, perhaps a bit of a motivational issue. You know, once once you start sort of sitting behind the eight ball in terms of trying to make the top four, you can understand why, you know, it's a bit harder to motivate yourself to push for a top eight race instead of a, you know, a flag race. I think few people would have predicted the drop off Richmond had this year where they finished like 12th on the ladder. So I won't beat myself up on that too much. Although, you know, Fair enough, I got it completely wrong. Finally, there's one team left and I'm gonna nominate the Brisbane Lions as my 2021 minor premier. The scary thing about Brisbane is that they finished top two in the previous two seasons and so much of their elite quality is still quite young. In particular, they've got an All-Australian key defender and a Brownlow medalist running through their midfield and both of these guys are still in the prime of their career. In terms of off-season moves, we know they've bolstered their forward line, adding Joe Danaher, who we know on his day can be an elite talent, but even if he doesn't recapture that form of about three years ago, he at least adds a little bit of a foil, a bit of support to someone like Eric Hipwood, and now their forward line just got a lot stronger. Okay, so I predicted the Brisbane Lions to sort of improve in a, in a linear sort of way with the organic group that they had on their list, in addition to getting the firepower and structure up forward in Joe Danaher. So for me, it made sense that Brisbane would be the team to beat, and I got that wrong. They finished fourth and went out in straight sets. It would be a bit of a disappointing way to finish the season for the Lions. They're certainly one of the best teams in the comp. They were genuine premiership contender this year, so it wasn't an absolute howler, but they were certainly not the team to beat as we saw. I believe next is my grand final prediction. I'm going to say that the Pies and Lions face off in this year's... Dis Enough of that. Fuck. And the Lions surprise everyone by winning on the MCG. In terms of a Brownlow medalist, I'm going to say that Lockie Neal goes back to back, but this time he shares it with Melbourne's Christian Petrarca, while Richmond's Tom Lynch surprisingly bobs up and wins the common. Hmm. Okay, so I've had Lockie Neal winning another Brownlow. I think he battled a lot of injury this year, and the other one I shouted out was Petrarca as well. Obviously had Ollie Wines not on the radar at all, but I do kind of like the idea that I had Petrarca in the mix, so I'll take it. Tom Lynch winning the common medal was an absolute stinker of a call, but then again, who would have predicted Harry Mackay winning it this year? For the rising star, I'm going to go with an easy nomination. Matthew Rao has an injury-free season to some extent and wins the rising star by country mile. I'm so sorry, Matthew Rao. I completely put the mockers on you. Well, there you have it, guys. Those are some of the stinkiest predictions you'll have ever seen for the 2021 AFL season. I think the next year, uh, and I will probably have a crack at doing a prediction fairly soon, a post-trade period one, and then do you know another one uh, after the JLT or whatever it's called now. But I am going to think long and hard before I make any big calls for a team to surprisingly slide or surprisingly bolt into the top four. It's been a learning experience. But you know what? Predictions are just meant to be a bit of fun at the end of the day. I hope that despite my terrible predictions, you guys are still enjoying the content. So appreciate it if you've watched all the way to the end of this video and appreciate if you've subscribed and stuck with the channel all throughout the 2021 season. For those interested in the draft, there will be more and more content coming up on that. We've still got about five or six weeks until the actual draft as well. So taking it slow and steady and hopefully we can produce something good for you in the upcoming weeks. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.